My name is Matt Ostley, and I'm a developer relations technical artist at Epic Games. I helped out the Quixel team with materials and performance on their medieval game environment. Today, we're going to talk about how we managed performance on the project. We'll talk about the kinds of metrics we use to measure performance and how they differ. Then we can talk about how we established our benchmarks and budgets, tested performance consistently, analyzed performance to highlight problem areas, and how you can apply these principles to your project. There's plenty to talk about when it comes to measuring performance, and today we'll be focusing specifically on rendering performance and how long it takes to render a frame. You may often hear performance described in terms of frames per second, or FPS. Well, it's good to think about your target FPS for your project, 30, 60, 120. It's much more helpful to think and measure in milliseconds, since milliseconds is linear, whereas frames per second is exponential. For example, if you're trying to get from 25 FPS to 30 FPS, you need to reduce your frame time by 7 milliseconds. But if you need to get from 55 FPS to 60 FPS, you only need an improvement of 1.5 milliseconds. That's a big difference. In order to consistently test performance for the project, I worked with Jacob and Victor to set a target hardware specification, resolution, and frame time. In order to account for some dynamic elements in the scene, and given our access to hardware during work from home, we set our benchmark as consistently hitting 33 FPS, or about 30 milliseconds, at 1080p with a 2080 RTX graphics card. Even though overall we're targeting 30 FPS, or 33.33 milliseconds, we set our performance targets a bit lower than that. This gives us a little wiggle room in case some spikes happen or a stray particle effect causes a jump in timing. While that should seem an easy target to hit, a 2080 RTX was top or near top of the line while we were working on the project, there's still plenty that can happen to cause a scene to not perform well even with those hardware specifications. We need to be able to quickly identify when something comes into the project that causes us to go over budget, and then we need to know that we've solved the issue. Since we were focused on the environment's performance and didn't have much in the way of dynamic gameplay elements, we chose to set up performance tracking cameras throughout the level. I put all of the performance tools in their own sublevel, and I made sure to tag each performance camera with the actor tag perfcam. I'll show you how I used that in a blueprint to automate our performance testing. As an aside, make sure you're scrolling down the details panel to the actor tab and setting the actor tag there instead of the component tag, which is oftentimes more visible in the details panel. Just trust me on this. Once the level had been blocked out, I went in and placed about 10 of these cameras at various points and angles that would give us a reasonable approximation of the player path. I was looking to catch some angles that would pose particularly challenging for performance, like this one looking back from the village toward the tree line where you start out. This shot in particular was difficult to tune because of the long sight lines, which means we'll have plenty to draw and shadows to worry about. I'll talk about how we overcame those challenges in the next couple of videos. Another benefit of using these cameras to track our performance is that every time we ran our tests, which I'll explain in a moment, we always got the exact same view. Any deviation left or right may create deviations in performance that make apples to apples testing impossible. So for example, if I check the frame time from this angle and change something, then come back to check again here, you can see that my view has changed ever so slightly. Now we're trying to render this whole part of the scene that we weren't before in the initial test shot. To make it easier to test performance and any changes we made to improve it, I set up a blueprint to automatically gather screenshots from each camera and GPU and CPU timing data with Unreal Insights, which we'll talk about in a bit. I'll walk you through the blueprint in overview. You can always download the project from the Unreal Engine Marketplace to dig in further or follow along. First up, on begin play, I get all actors with tags to find all the performance cameras. Since this function doesn't always return a deterministic order, I built a simple sorting function to sort through the performance cameras by the trailing digit in their actor label. This means when I look at the data, I will know that the first chunk I see is always for camera zero, and I want my screenshots to be in the same order too since we can then use those to make work in progress GIFs later. Next, I built a few functions to start the testing procedure and iterate over the cameras while the game is running. Start perf, end perf, do perf test, set cam, next cam, and prev cam. The start perf functionality really just resets some internal variables, turns on stat FPS, and fires off do perf test with the advanced flag set to true. So instead of looping over all the cameras, it's more like we're recursing through the list. I needed to do that this way since the actual tests involve a few delays. Delays in for loops don't always behave the way that you want them to, so this is how I overcame that limitation. 
Once we get into the test for each camera, I set the view target of the player to the current camera, then I trigger the console command trace.start. This tells Unreal Insights to start collecting timing data for the GPU and CPU. We'll gather about two seconds worth of data, then call the console command trace.stop. These trace.start and stop functions are new for Unreal Insights in 426. Then we'll take a screenshot, output to the log that the camera has finished, delay for about a second, then advance to the next camera. When we've reached the final camera, we'll kick off end perf, which resets our view to the player pawn and turns off the stat FPS overlay. Now I can test any functionality I need to test in the level without having to reboot the project. Our performance sublevel has one and only one of these blueprints, along with the eight performance tracking cameras I placed throughout the scene. The full testing procedure is to package the build, close the editor, launch the project, make sure we're in full screen, and hit play in the menu. Next, I raise the console command input by pressing the tilde key and type KE asterisk start perf. The KE asterisk basically means loop over every blueprint and try and call a custom event called start perf. Since we only have one blueprint that has the start perf function on it, I know we're only kicking this off once. Now we'll sit back and watch the test. I can watch the stat FPS ticker on the right side of the screen to get a good idea of how things are going, but I'll show you how to dive into the data in a moment. I also added a bit of extra functionality to the blueprint to help me further diagnose any issues using tools like StatGPU, ProfileGPU, and RenderDoc. I can run the console command ke star set cam number, and I'll immediately set my view to that camera. It won't run the test, but being able to get to these cameras quickly and consistently makes it easier to test and diagnose anything that could be going wrong. Let's take a look at that performance data we capture with Unreal Insights first. The final step in the test process is to check the average inclusive time for the GPU and record that information in a spreadsheet that I share with everyone working on the project. Unreal Insights is a standalone profiling system that integrates with the Unreal Engine to collect, analyze, and visualize data from the engine. It covers a wide range of Unreal Engine systems and can be set up to record remotely to minimize performance impact on your actual application. If you're running Unreal from the Epic Games launcher, you can find Unreal Insights in the Engine Binaries Win64 directory. If you've compiled Unreal from source, like if you've downloaded it from GitHub, you can build the project yourself through the source editor of your choice. Either way, once we open Insights, we'll first click this Open File button, then navigate to our Packaged Builds Saved Profiling folder, and we'll see a .utrace file. Let's open that up and see what we've got. Now, this might look like a lot of data to process, but the good news is that we only need to worry about a few things for now. First, in the column view on the right side of the screen, I'll right click and go to View Column, then click Average Inclusive Time Milliseconds. Next, we can see these breaks in the timing data. These breaks are the times between our cameras, and I found it really helpful to isolate the timings for each camera. I'll click and drag in the timing view to highlight the first camera and zoom in on it. You can see this top value here in the column view called unaccounted, which encompasses all the calls made by the GPU. If I highlight this two second section, we can see over on the right here, this is the data that I want. I can see the average inclusive time for all of the unaccounted calls in my selection, which is about 36 milliseconds. I'll record that in my spreadsheet here and do that for each subsequent camera. We can see by looking back at our spreadsheet here that we definitely went over budget for a good stretch of time before we got a handle on performance. It is of course better to try and keep this under control as much as possible so you don't spend too much time panicking at the end of your project to try and get performance under control. The added benefit of checking and maintaining performance early and often is that you end up wasting much less effort in making your scene. Why spend extra hours dressing up your scene if you're only going to have to go back and make cuts to it later? Budgeting for performance will depend on your application, direction, design, and values. Since performance isn't a menu where you can order five static and two skeletal meshes and those will always cost five milliseconds or something like that, there's no equivalent exchange because of the myriad of factors involved in rendering a frame, some of which we'll discuss in more detail in a later video. Instead, I think a better approach would be to think of performance budgeting like a pie chart. We know how long we have to render a frame, and we can divvy up that time proportionally based on what features we want to showcase, which we're less interested in featuring, and what's important to us. For example, in the medieval game environment, we knew we had three big constraining factors for performance. One, we wanted to have a full time of day cycle, which meant fully dynamic lighting. Two we were going to use the new volumetric clouds, which have their own performance costs that we can see specifically in captures and stat panels, and three, 
Our goal is to highlight the quality of Quixel assets in a next-gen quality environment. With our values, constraints, and performance targets in mind, we developed a loose budget for each of the major areas in a frame. Shadows, lighting, base pass, volumetric clouds, etc. You may consider creating a beautiful corner or vertical slice of your environment that uses all of the features that you want and looks as good as you want to inform your budgets. I used these numbers as cues to let me know when one feature or another was getting more expensive than we wanted, and I could go in and find ways to bring those numbers back into range. Throughout this project, my goal was to make as few hard cuts as possible. The goal was to maintain the visual quality that Jacob and Victor were producing, and we were able to do that within our performance targets, which again was 30 millisecond frames at 1920 by 1080 on a 2080 RTX card. So let's look in on our worst performing camera and see what we can see. It looks like we're spending a lot of time in shadow projection, lighting, and the base pass. Now, I know what my budgets are, and I know that my goal is going to be to make as few hard cuts as possible. So I'm not just going to go through and decimate our static meshes to get the base pass down, or put a hard cutoff on dynamic shadows. Stick around for the next couple of videos and I'll show you how we employed a few simple tricks to improve our performance without sacrificing visual quality. As you've probably figured out by now, there's so much to talk about with performance optimization, and I could talk about it for hours, so I'll summarize what we've talked about so far. One, set reasonable and repeatable performance targets for your project. Two, within those reasonable performance targets, create budgets for rendering features. If you're unsure, base your numbers on beautiful corners or vertical slices that showcase your desired visual quality. Three, be sure you're testing your performance in consistent and repeatable ways. Four, start gathering performance data early and often. And five, communicate the status of your performance to everyone on the project. Performance is everyone's responsibility. In the next couple of videos, I'll show you how we improved the performance of our scene without affecting visual quality by tuning our lights and shadows, combining draw calls, using HLODs, and setting call distances. Thanks for watching.